This time around, as you can see, we're going to be looking at financial metrics and ratios that you can use to analyze and compare different companies. We're going to do a couple of things in this tutorial. I'm going to start by walking you through why you might care about these and how you use them. Then we'll go into Excel briefly and look at the calculations for some of these items. Once you understand how to calculate some of these metrics and ratios, we're going to do a comparison between three companies, Walmart, Amazon, and Salesforce, three companies that we've used throughout these tutorials and several other examples as well. If you want, you can also pull up their financial statements and actually go through these calculations yourself. Based on that analysis, we're going to draw some conclusions about the companies and what their valuations might be and how the market is actually thinking about these three different but related companies. So let's start with the first point, which is why do you care about this? What's the point of these key metrics and ratios? Really, the point is to evaluate and compare different companies. So when you're looking at possible companies to invest in, or if you're working at a bank, possible companies to advise or potential buyers or sellers in an m and deal, for example, you want to figure out why one company might be more highly valued by the market than others. Now, there might be many reasons for this. You could have qualitative factors. You could have one market segment or one industry that is hot at the moment and that is attracting a lot of investor attention. And all that's fine, but the purpose of this analysis is to look at the numbers and go back to the financial performance of these companies, both historically and going forward, and use that to figure out why the valuations might be different. And to do that, the key tool that we use is known as financial metrics and ratios. Now, there are actually dozens, if not hundreds of these, so we cannot possibly cover all of these in a short tutorial here, but I will introduce you now to some of the more important ones and some of the ones that you'll see coming up again and again in different industries and for different companies. The purpose of all this is to be able to answer questions like, how much equity does a company require to generate a certain amount of after-tax profit? So when you factor in how much equity it's raised from shareholders and also how much it's generated on its own in the form of retained earnings and other sources of capital that it's saved up over the time and hasn't spent on anything, how much is actually required for it to generate a certain amount of after-tax profit? So how efficiently is it using that capital that's saved up? You could also answer questions such as how much in assets is required to generate a certain amount of after-tax profit. So let's say a company has a certain amount of buildings or factories or inventory. How much does it really need to generate a certain amount of net income when all is said and done? And then finally, how much total capital is required to generate a certain amount of after-tax profits? So not just equity, but also factoring in debt, and preferred stock and other long-term funding sources. Of course, you can also answer other questions such as how dependent a company is on its assets. So when a company earns revenue, when it makes sales, how important is its asset base to do that? Is it very important as it would be for say a construction or manufacturing company? Or is it not important at all as it would be for say a software or a biotech or pharmaceutical company? You can also figure out how liquid the company is. So when you take a look at its short-term or current assets versus its short-term or current liabilities, does it have enough on hand to repay all of its short-term obligations if something disastrous happens? And then you can also see how quickly a company goes through its inventory, how quickly it pays its invoices, how quickly it collects receivables. So if it's delivered products to customers, but the customers haven't paid in cash yet, you want to look at that and evaluate how quickly it's actually collecting them. If it's not collecting them, if there's a high percentage that are delinquent, that it's not going to collect, these types of metrics and ratios let you answer those questions and compare companies on the basis of these numbers. So here are a few examples. Return on equity is defined as net income over average shareholders equity. If we go into Excel quickly, I have up here the numbers for Walmart. And if you go down 
we've calculated return on equity historically for the company here. We have just taken the annual net income and divided by the average shareholder's equity. So we're taking the ending number from the year before and the ending number for this year, averaging them together, and then taking net income and dividing by that average number. So that's return on equity. And then return on assets is very similar, net income over average total assets. So for this calculation, you can see what we're doing. We're just taking Walmart's annual net income and then we're dividing by the average total assets. Now, they are a consumer retail company, one of the largest, if not the largest retailers in the world. So of course, the total assets are gonna be very, very high here because of their inventory and their plants, property and equipment and other factors like that. And then one final one here is called return on invested capital. And this one's a little bit harder to define because it depends on metrics that we just don't have time to cover here. But for this one, you take something called NOPAT, and then you divide by all the company's funding sources. NOPAT is really a variation on net income. And I'll show you the calculation down here. Net operating profit after taxes divided by invested capital. Net operating profit after taxes, like I said, is really just a variation on net income. And the idea is that with net income, you are taking EBIT, earnings before interest and taxes, and then you are subtracting the interest expense and then multiplying by one minus the tax rate to get to it. But with NOPAT, you're not factoring in the net interest expense at all. So you're taking EBIT or operating income as is, and you're simply multiplying by one minus the tax rate. So this is sort of a hypothetical metric that lets you see if the company had no debt and had no cash and was therefore earning no interest income and paying no interest expense, what would its net income be if it had none of that going on and if it were simply its operating income times one minus the tax rate? And the reason why we've matched this up with invested capital, which is defined as equity plus debt, is that invested capital represents all the shareholders in the business. Here, we just have equity and debt, but we could have preferred stock. We could have other funding sources as well. And so we want the numerator for return on invested capital, which is net operating profit after taxes, to also represent something that is available to all the investors in the company. So if we use net income here, it wouldn't really make any sense because invested capital represents all the investors, but net income is only going to be available to the equity investors in the company. Why? Because the debt investors have already been paid with the interest expense. So that is why it works a little bit differently here and why we use NOPAT instead of net income in the numerator. Now, the meaning for all these items is somewhat straightforward, but can be a little bit tricky sometimes. With return on equity, the way to think about it is you want to see how efficiently a company is using its equity to generate after-tax profits. So with Walmart, for example, return on equity of around 20 to 25% is actually quite high for a non-bank, for a normal company like this. This means that for each dollar of equity they raise from shareholders or that they generate on their own, they're earning about 20 to 25% of that back in the form of after-tax profits. So that is quite high for a company like this. Return on assets tells you how well a company is using its assets. You could also view it as how dependent it is on them, or you could view it as for each dollar of assets they have or acquire, what amount of net income are they generating? So here, for example, return on assets, we have it around eight to 9% which is actually also quite high for a company like this. What this is telling us is that right now, Walmart has around $200 billion worth of assets and around 16 or 17 billion of net income. So if they boosted their assets, if this went up to 250 billion instead, then their net income theoretically should be around eight or 9% times that 50 billion increase higher. So this is telling us by what percentage their net income should increase, theoretically, if their asset base increases by a certain amount. And then return on invested capital 
is related to both these. It's telling you how well a company is using all its capital or how much capital is required to actually grow its business. So down here, return on invested capital is around 13 or 14 percent, also relatively high for a consumer retail company like this. And so what this is telling you is that theoretically, if you put in, say, 10 billion more debt or equity or both into the company, then their NOPAT should increase by around 13 or 14 percent times that 10 billion, so around 1.3 or 1.4 billion higher. That would be the increase there. So that's the meaning of these metrics and how you can interpret them. The other metrics are a little bit more straightforward, so we're going to go through them more quickly. There's the asset turnover ratio, which is revenue over average assets, and then the current ratio, which is current assets over current liabilities. Now for the asset turnover ratio, you can see it calculated for Walmart right here, revenue divided by total assets. Very simply, you could think of it as how quickly a company is going through its assets to generate a certain amount of revenue, or you could think of it as how dependent a company is on its assets to earn sales. The current ratio is really telling you worst case scenario. What if the company suddenly had to repay all its short-term obligations? Would it be able to do that? And in this case, it seems like the answer is no, because this is below 1x. It's around 0.8 to 0.9x. But for a consumer retail company, this is actually in a relatively fine range. And for a company like Walmart, it's not as if they're in danger of going bankrupt any day soon. Then you have some other turnover ratios. Inventory turnover, which is COGS over average inventory. Receivables turnover, which is revenue over average accounts receivable. And then payables turnover, which is COGS over average accounts payable. Now I've starred the last one here for reasons that we'll get into in a little bit. But for the first two, it really is as simple as saying, how much inventory does a company go through each year? So when it buys inventory and it sells it as products to customers, how many times does it do that each year? And how quickly does it go through its inventory on hand? With receivables turnover, the idea is similar, but it's not about inventory. Now it's about collecting receivables from customers that have not yet been paid in cash. So with both of these, we see the inventory turnover for Walmart is around 8 to 9x, which means that it is going through all of its inventory on hand about 8 to 9 times each year. So almost every month, they're selling all their inventory, which is very high for a consumer retail company like this. We can look at some of the other companies here, but it's not even applicable for Salesforce and for Amazon, it's about in the same range. Receivables turnover. So what this is telling us is that the company has minimal receivables really because their revenue is so much higher than their receivables that they are collecting these very, very quickly, a matter of four or five Ds if you look at the numbers. So they're very, very efficient collecting. And then payables turnover, unsurprisingly, they are somewhat less efficient paying their suppliers. They're really taking their time on this. They're waiting something like 30 to 40 days, whereas for their own customers, they're collecting in four or five days on average. So those are some insights we can gain from that. Now, the reason I starred payables turnover is that you can define this slightly differently depending on the company. For a retailer, yes, you would probably link this to COGS, divided by average accounts payable as we did here. But if it is not an inventory dependent company, such as Salesforce over here, we've defined it slightly differently. And here we're taking accounts payable plus accrued expenses. And then we're using COGS plus operating expenses, not just COGS because cost of goods sold means something very different when the company doesn't actually sell physical inventory. So you can define this one slightly differently but that is the basic idea with all these metrics and ratios. So let's go back to Excel now and go through the interpretation of these. And what I want you to think about is as we go through it, think about which company you think should be valued most highly based on the numbers and our interpretation. And then at the end, I'm going to reveal the punchline and I'm gonna tell you which company was actually valued most highly and some of the drawbacks around this type of analysis. So we've already been through the numbers for Walmart. 
And what I really want to focus on here is the comparison between Walmart and some of these other companies. So to do this, I'm going to set up a frame at the top so that we can see everything a little bit more easily. And let's start with the return based metrics. So return on equity, return on assets, return on invested capital. We know what these are for Walmart. Now for Amazon, these are all much, much lower. Return on equity is below 10%. It's actually negative in one year, slightly positive in year three. Return on assets is close to zero and return on invested capital is around 4% to 7%, something in that range. And then for Salesforce, these metrics are even worse because look at this. All of these are negative. Their net income is negative. Their NOPAT, net operating profit after taxes, is also a negative number in each year. So on the surface, if we had to rank these companies, we'd say Walmart is number one, Amazon is number two, and then Salesforce is number three. Now, if you look at some of the other metrics and ratios, like the asset turnover ratio and the current ratio, these are not terribly insightful because the asset turnover ratio is very close for Amazon and Walmart. And for Salesforce, it is much lower, but that's not really surprising because these are different types of companies. You're comparing a software company to retail companies. The current ratio similarly is not terribly insightful here. It is the lowest for Salesforce. So its current assets are significantly lower than its current liabilities. For Amazon, its current assets actually exceed its current liabilities. So it seems to have the most liquidity out of all these companies. And then Walmart is somewhere in the middle in terms of liquidity. And if you look into why this is happening, we can actually answer that question with the next set of metrics, inventory turnover, receivables turnover, and payables turnover. So we've been through these for Walmart. If you do a side-by-side -side comparison with Amazon though, inventory is about the same for both companies. Receivables turnover is significantly lower for Amazon, meaning that it takes them longer to collect receivables from customers. So they're spending more like 15 to 20 days on it on average. Walmart is more like four or five days. And then payables turnover, there's even more of a contrast. This is much lower for Amazon than it is for Walmart, meaning that Amazon is taking much, much longer to pay its suppliers. And this actually factors into part of the reason why the current ratio is the way it is being significantly higher for Amazon than it is for Walmart because its treatment of these items is also significantly different. It's taking longer to collect and it's also taking longer to pay its suppliers. And then if you go to Salesforce, inventory turnover is not meaningful because it doesn't have inventory. Receivables turnover interestingly it takes about 90 to 100 days to collect and then payables turnover is also quite high not quite as high as amazon's but significantly higher than walmart's so it is taking quite a long time to actually pay its suppliers here so based on all this it seems like walmart is really the best company if you look at metrics like return on equity and return on assets and return on invested capital. Amazon is negative on some of those. Salesforce is negative on all of those. And Walmart tends to have higher margins. It shows more consistency with those margins. We didn't even get into the margins, but I do have those listed up here at the top as well. So on the surface, it really seems like Walmart is the better company or perhaps the best company here. The inventory management for Walmart and Amazon is very similar, but Walmart collects and pays invoices much more quickly. It does have some more debt, but overall, it seems like it's a better run and more efficient business. Here's the punchline though. At the time of the analysis, here were the actual valuation multiples for these companies. We're just gonna look at the PE multiple or the price to earnings multiple here. Walmart was around 16X, which is fairly standard for most companies. Usually you see PE multiples of between 10 and 20 X. Amazon was at 450 X. So price to earnings was 450 times versus 16 times for Walmart. That's not a typo. It really was that high. Their market cap was astronomically high compared to their earnings. And for Salesforce, 
it wasn't even meaningful because they had negative net income at the time of this analysis. So the results here might not be what you were expecting. And the question on your mind should be, how could this be the case? How could one company that has so much better financial metrics and better performance seemingly be valued at a much lower multiple than these other companies in the market? And the answer is that the market was valuing these companies all based on different criteria. So with Walmart, you have an established, mature, slower growth company. For a company like that, the use of capital, their margins, how they're managing inventory, how they're managing receivables and payables becomes a lot more important because these are some of the ways that a mature business can gain a competitive advantage over other companies. But with Amazon and Salesforce, these were both higher growth companies and they were much more about reinvestment into the business and expansion even at the expense of lower margins and very poor looking financial metrics. So going back to Excel, the line item that really explains all of this is that Walmart was growing at around five or six or two percent per year. Amazon was growing at more like 20% to 40% per year. And then Salesforce was growing at around 30 to 40% per year. And those growth rates really tell you all the story you need to know about these companies. You're comparing two much higher growth companies in more favorable industries, newer industries, to one very old school, mature company growing at a much slower rate. So the moral of the story is that key metrics and ratios can be useful, but they are more useful in certain situations and contexts than they are in others. They're best when you're comparing companies of similar sizes, similar growth rates, similar margins, and ideally similar industries. So this comparison would be a lot better if instead of Walmart, we looked at say two or three similarly sized mid-sized retailers in the US or another country, instead of looking at one company that's an offline retailer, an online retailer, and then not a retailer at all, but rather a software company. So that's why this comparison doesn't exactly hold up and why we get some very strange results. These key metrics and ratios are less useful when you're comparing very different companies or when you're looking at high growth companies that don't care as much about capital management. For companies like that, the market tends to value them very strongly on their growth and growth potential, even if their margins are poor or their other metrics and ratios don't look good. It's all about growth if you have a company at that stage of its business. So key metrics and ratios can be very useful and very important, but you have to be careful about how you use them and you have to be careful about the companies to analyze when you are going through an exercise like this. Mm -hmm.